James, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. Uh, it feels early, even though it's 10 a.m., but I'm glad to be here. It's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, it is going to be good. It's going to be good. And, and I actually agree. It does, does feel early. I've, I'm, I'm like hugging my coffee. As if oh, it's going to give me I'm some jealous. kind of strength to, to get. But it's, it's 10 o'clock. I don't know why we feel so. We're gamers, man. It's too early. Exactly. Yeah. Too old. Sim racing yeah. is a hobby that's meant to be done in the evening. You know? <laughs> Interesting. To most people. You've... Right. Okay. So... Obviously, we like to start from the beginning. But since you've said that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna press that point. Why, why is it an evening activity? I've always thought that if, if you're if you're coming at it from like an athletic point of view, like a professional sim racing stance, it's like early when your when your mind's firing and you've maybe done some exercise, and it's like the nine to five, right? But do you still prefer to train in the evenings? So weirdly enough, I prefer uh, the nine to five approach uh, since I've been doing it professionally since 2019. I prefer getting up, as you say, you're sharp, get on it, do the morning, have a lunch break, do the afternoon, then you have your evening to sort of have a have a life or touch grass mm. and do those sort of things. Um, but since joining Merck, my teammates are the opposite, so they prefer the evening. So I've been, I've just been in this routine, basically, of, of getting on at, say, 2, 3 p.m. and finishing at sort of 7, 8, 9 mm. Um, so yeah, I, naturally I've been waking up later and I've just been in that sort of routine. So, but I, yeah, I do prefer the mornings. As you say, you just, you're sharp, you sort of, you have loads of energy and yeah. Okay. Interesting. Now there is something that I can't let slip, right? And I realize that this is a audio format and 99% of our listeners listen through Spotify and Google rather than YouTube, but you are sat next to what is the most enormous industrial looking <laughs> air conditioning unit I have ever seen in my whole life. Like, do you, is this because you get super hot when you're racing or are you just in somewhere that's not the UK and raining right now? This is my best friend right here. Uh, this is like, what's, everyone what's talks about it. Uh, I haven't named it yet, actually. Um, oh. We should probably try and name it. But mm. every time I stream or make a video, like it's always in the comments, like, "What is that? You know, is that <laughs> is that is that a spaceship? What is it? But it's just an aircon <laughs> unit." You know what it reminds me of, right? Um, and this might show my age, but do you ever watch Teletubbies as a kid? Yeah. Long do you remember that like, Nunu? Yeah. E, vaguely, yeah. You know, Nunu was the little Hoover that used to go around. Looks like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of <laughs> looks like your own. Little like sim racing Nunu. So like, if it's if like Nunu met crew chief, that's that's what it would be. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, it gets so hot in the UK. Like in in the house in the houses, we're not designed for like thirty degrees. So when it gets mm. that hot and you're sim racing in a in a really hot room, if I didn't have that, I just wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't be able to concentrate. I'd be sweating. You know, it'd be crazy. So I need it. We're um, we're actually trying to set a date with a, a company for the podcast called O Rouge, who make like the most genius a uh, bit of hardware ever it's like a chilled sim racing chair so like it, it it's, it's like refrigerated <laughs> which yeah. actually when you think about that it sounds good is so smart yeah but, and that is that that's that, that's their thing it's like cold cold gaming chairs and cold cold sim racing chairs yeah. which is which is genius it sounds like you could uh you could use one um definitely anyway We'll move on. I've got massively distracted um, <laughs> straight away uh, in this conversation, which is, is, is a good sign. It's a good sign. So, James, you uh, said before we came on air that you've you listened to one of our episodes before, so you know that we like to tell the story, like the the human story um, of, of sim racing. And there's there'll be a little bit of like you know tire pressures, this false feedback, that. But we like to hear the story of the people who kind of make sim racing what it is. And I think it's probably fair to say, given your impressive resume uh you are one of the people who are, who has made sim racing what it is so it would be great to to hear your story so first question i like to ask is what was the first time you interacted with motorsport and or sim racing or racing games and which came first uh so where do i start so i first went to an indoor kart track when i was eight years old just eighth birthday me and my dad always used to watch Formula One. My dad, my family have no motorsport background at all. Nothing. Um, my dad used to work in the Navy. So he has sort of an understanding of like mechanics and used to work on helicopters and stuff like that. No so effectively, cool. uh, yeah, we went karting one week. Um, there was sort of three other lads who'd been before and stuff like that. And I sort of, I did it and I was naturally just okay. Like I beat them, no problem sort of was clicking quite naturally so we kept on going back and for the first like two years we were just 
once a week going to this indoor kart track. And uh, after a while, we sort of got the budget to go and do some outdoor racing as well, some owner kart stuff. And yeah, I, I race karts, not like top level, like, like, you know, championship or British level, but sort of just like owner kart level uh, till I was like 15, 16. And then it won a few like championships and stuff, but the the, the, runny, the, the, the money soon ran out and um, mm. had to stop and, you know, to find your, your way in life. So, you know, when I got a job and stuff like that. So for those that don't know, um, <laughs> including me, uh, owner karting so I, I go to one of these like arrive and drive championships where it's once once a month you go and you tally the schools tally up over the, the years the standard championship but it's it's higher kart racing which anybody who's done a higher kart championship will know that the frustration is that all the carts are different you know mm. that some there's 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 a lot of slow carts and there'll be like one or two that'll just be like absolute miles ahead um i won a race right at this championship in one of these carts and it felt great but i was like at half a lap ahead of the guys who were fast i was like mm, this is not me this is definitely <laughs> not not a talent right this is this is the cart so tell us about the difference between um if somebody was considering getting into owner car what's the what are the the pros and cons of going into the owner car championships it's just more money yeah uh, you know you have your own car you have to mechanic it yourself service it yourself set it up is yourself that is that easy to learn well i think that was a disadvantage for me and my dad we didn't really know what we were doing um so you can pay a team to do it but that's more money isn't it so it's just expensive yeah. and you know eventually we stopped doing that and i filtered out into sort of higher car stuff you know stuff like super gt super gt's done like club 100 and yeah. stuff like that um which is great because it's cheaper and it's easy to sort of turn up and race but yeah when i got 16 i stopped doing that because financially it didn't make sense anymore and i had to go and find a job i was like a junior apprentice mechanic for a bit for a race team I ended up doing engineering and becoming like a machinist um mm. making parts for like airplanes and stuff like that which it sounds boring, but it was a really good job. I actually really enjoyed it. Doesn't sound um, boring at all. Sounds sounds really interesting. Yeah, it was it was good. I really I was there for like four years, um, and then in 2017, whilst working for that firm, just in the evenings, I'd come home and uh, eventually, wow, well, you know, everyone gets a bit bored in the evenings and stuff like that. So mm. I, I bought a wheel and pedal set with Project Cars One, and. Uh, just started playing that in the evenings very casually, like just bolted it to the desk and just started doing laps. And that's sort of how I got into sim racing, you know? So I had like a base foundation of, uh, of driving skill from karting. And then um, I sort of used that to be fairly decent when I got a, a wheel and pedal set. Um, and what wheel and pedal set was it? It was a, I think it's a Logitech G920, I think. Okay. okay. Yeah, for Xbox. Um, on a massive 38 inch, uh, really thick TV, <laughs> the wheel delay was like four seconds. <laughs> no, uh, you, you have to like really kind of like turning in early, all of a sudden had a totally different meaning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The line just to make sure that it did it in game in time. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I did that just casually for like a few months. Um, and then I don't know, I, it's all a bit of a blurb. I don't know how I actually got into doing it sort of competitively like not professionally mm. but i think i i saw on twitter like an esl event i think it was called a go for cup uh on project cars one and i thought you can you can enter a competition here what? and you could i think the winner won 50 euros so i was like what you can earn money i was like no way 50, so, sorry just 50 50 euros 50 euros yeah okay why no, I just wondered if it's fifty euros or like fifty thousand euros. It sounds no, like no, no, ESL. No, no. That sounds like it sounds. Like but this was proper around, right? proper community stuff, like so. Right, okay, and this yeah, was this yeah. was twenty seventeen. So the thing is, I was very unaware of say GT Academy that ha had happened like four years prior. Um, I literally had no idea what sim racing was. To be honest, mm. um, I just done karting and just coincidentally got a wheel and pedals and um, yeah, entered this ESL competition. Uh, I think I was in the final. I didn't win, but I loved it. I loved the competition. I loved that you could race other people online. I ended up speaking to a few of the people on the grid, and uh, I still speak to a couple of them today. Um, and just got to know the space a bit better. Like they were better than me, so I sort of learned a lot from them, mm. um, just about settings and stuff like that. And yeah, that's how I got into it. That's how I got the bug. And then I kept on doing it every day after work, just obsessed for like the first year and a half. And then yeah, from that. 
it took me like a year, a year and a half to go from just doing it from a, as a hobby to getting paid to do it. So crazy, really. But that's rapid. That's rapid. And there must have been some step in that year and a half. What were the key moments that led you to being able to do it as a as a paid job? There must have been something, some introduction or some series that you ran in or or some wins. What what was it that that triggered? The move because there'll be a lot of people listening to this who are uh, diehard sim sim racers who'll be trying to work out how to navigate the series that they race in the leagues they race in the championships that they race in to give themselves the best chance of being able to go go pro could you pinpoint which events in that year and a half you think were, were most kind of instrumental in in allowing you to go full-time well i think i fast-tracked like i mean you hear some sim racers have been doing it for like 10 15 years um i had a foundational knowledge from karting and how to sort of drive um and race and qualify and so i already knew how to do that so when i got into sim racing that bit was sort of already ticked i just had to learn how to be quick on the sim um so yeah in terms of the competitions and stuff that got me from uh, from doing it as a hobby to doing it and getting paid um I think it was just going through the motions in terms of where the the big competitions were on what games. So like Project Cars 1, there wasn't too much. Project Cars 2, there was a little bit. Um, I was able to join a team uh, or a couple of teams, but I wasn't getting paid for it. But I could win some prize money if I won a competition. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I, I sort of, when I was at the front of these things, I was like, right, I need to be doing the biggest thing here. Like if I'm going to, I have this mindset where if I do anything, and it does, some sometimes it holds me back because it just... It's almost too competitive but if i'm doing something i have to be doing the best version of that thing like i have to just you know what's the point of mm. doing something half ass you know you may as well do it properly um so when i was doing it i looked at like f1 esports which was sort of still it was just growing at the time i think it was in like season two of, of f1 esports and gran turismo uh forza all those competitions i was eyeing all of them up i was like which one am i going to go and try and do and um, I chose the F1 game just because it was the biggest one, and it still is, to be fair. Mm. And um, just started, well, I bought the game, started practicing, doing time trial, entering league races, started off in like League Two of AOR, Apex Online Racing back in the day. Yeah. Getting some wins on that, eventually getting to split one and sort of mixing it with the, the, the well known guys like, you know, Brendan Lee and all that. Yeah. And when I started doing that, the opportunity sort of came um the team start getting in your inboxes and mm. when you get a foot in the door and you get into doing f1 esports um you know and being in the mix to be on a roster that's when you can start demanding some some money um i was still working at the time and then i, I got to a point where i i could not practice the same amount as some of the others who were doing it full time so i said to the team i was with like i need to i, I need to get to get paid to do this properly otherwise you know there's no there's no point me doing this half fast and getting home from work tired yeah. and trying to and trying to keep up with these guys that are practicing every day all day yeah and they were like yeah fair point we'll uh we'll give you this a month and um that's when it became professional and that was mid the middle of 2019 i think so yeah so the two things stand out to me there the, the first one is it doesn't seem like you were phased at all by the idea of going from one game to another and the, and the second is that you kind of you kind of wrote your own fate in that you were like well i want to go full time so these people that i'm racing for i'm going to tell them if you want me to do this for you i'm, I'm going to go full time so it, it it's kind of, it's kind of interesting it's very it's a very you what i'm getting is you have to be kind of very bold um were you not phased at all by the idea of of going from project cars where you put in sounds like you sunk hundreds thousands of hours into it to get really really good to then just going okay well let's see where the biggest tournaments are i might not be on project cars but it doesn't matter i'll i'll get good at it whatever it is yeah <clears throat> i mean yeah I, I guess that's just an approach isn't it you know there's no point being phased by you know oh you know maybe thinking to yourself i can't do this or i can't do that you know i just assumed if i was at the, the top of one game that it shouldn't be an issue to get to the top of another game you know it's still driving at the end of the day you still turn the mm-hmm. wheel and press the pedals um <laughs> just in a slightly different way you know yeah. um and i think the level back then was slightly lower than it is now like mm. I think now it'd be a lot harder to just do that. But I got very fortunate at the time of doing it, 2018, 2019, that sort of uh, time period, that the level was good. But as I say, if I if I was to do it now, it would be a lot harder. So, um, yeah. 
it, interesting because you you did make it happen in the sense that you you were kind of on the edge of being able to go full time and then essentially said to this team pay me so that I can do this so that I can race better for you I suppose nowadays you're right there's more people doing it which means it's more competitive but there's more teams there's more tournaments there's more competitions so as much as the um you know the demand on driver skill is higher there are a lot more places that you can go and race there's a lot more paid paid drives to use that phrase um in sim racing now uh than there used to be yeah there is and Back then, I, I think it was realistically, it was only the F1 guys and Forza guys. You know, that, that's not even mm. a thing really anymore, Forza Esports, um, that were getting paid. Um, whereas now you've got you've got so many. I, I don't know if the Gran Turismo guys get paid still. I, I know that was a bit of a saga, but the F1 guys definitely get paid, some of them quite a lot. ESLR1 drivers get paid. ACC drivers, a lot of them are getting paid. R-Factor, yeah. like... It's it's just the, the whole scene's grown to an extent that that you know when I first started there was probably like ten twenty people that were doing it full time if that mm-hmm. whereas now I could probably there's definitely over fifty you know maybe mm-hmm. even more than that to be honest um, which is cool it's, I mean as a, I, I probably haven't stressed enough like because I'm I'm sort of used to it now but when I was working as a machinist and doing it as a hobby if you said the the sort of journey I've been on and others have been on as well. I'd be like, from playing a racing game, are you mad? <laughs> you mental? Like, just no way, no way. But yeah, as I say, now I'm in it and I've been doing it for a while. It's sort of normal, but it's it's not normal. Like, it, this is not the way I thought my life would go and in a good way. <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah. So when did that first jump, like that first real jump into competitive sim racing happen? Like, what was the competition? What was, like, was it F1 esports? I think I read somewhere that you got into that a little bit. Like, where was that first, like, big step into the scene? I think the biggest thing for me, uh, the biggest competition that sort of put me on the the map was uh, the E-Racer Champions, E-Rock, in 2019. So there was a qualifier at the back end of 2018 where um, I think Veloce the team I was with at the time, they got a they got an invite and they they had to put one driver forward. And at, at the time, I, I remember talking to one of the guys who runs Veloce and he said, I, I was like, w- where do you see my sort of career going? And he was like, um, to be honest with you, I, I don't know. I mean, you don't play F1 that much. You know, we need to find a route for you. Otherwise, you know, there's no point you being in the team if you're not winning mm. things and doing stuff. So I was like, damn, I need, I need to sort of prove myself here. So this competition, e- E-Rock had a qualifier on a set of Corsa in that stadium format that they do, the 1v1. And they put me forward for it. And I was like, right, this is it. This is the big one. You know, I was racing all the big names like Enzo Benito and um, I don't know, he wasn't doing it, but like Yoni Tormula and all the big, big names of sim racing. And I was like, right, this is my one chance. I've got, I've got to do the business here. So I did loads of practice for it. And uh, it was all on one evening and I, I managed to win it. And it allowed me to qualify for the final of E-Rock, where there was me versus Seb Job, Brendan Lee, and Nils Nujox in Mexico. So all paid for, flown out to Mexico, you know, VIP treatment. Literally at the airport, they found all four of us, escorted us through the airport. It was sick. I mean, you got to remember at the time as well, like I, this, I was not used to anything like this. Like when yeah. this happened, I was like, I couldn't believe that a game had got me to this point. And, um, yeah, so I got to E-Rock and won the final, managed to go into the race of champions and win a race against a real racing driver as well. So like at that point, I was like, damn, like that's it, mad. It's it's kind of nuts, right? So we had um we had Steve Brown on uh recently, Super GT, and we it, we had him on the podcast the week of um the Gran Turismo film coming out. Um and it was interesting because we had watched the whole Grid Finder team had gone after work and we'd watched the Gran Turismo film. And then I think a couple of days later, uh, we had Steve on the podcast. And it was interesting how real that film was it, in the sense of like the personal journeys of the people involved. Um, like he essentially did exactly the same as Jan Mardenborough, like without, you know, without the, without some of the details and the actual events that they went to. But in terms of the journey of uh you know karting sim racing to then it being a, a full-time job um and now and now racing in the the real world as has obviously just done the Nurburgring um series with uh Jimmy Broadbent um 
but it's interesting how many parallels there are so first of all have you seen the film and second of all did you watch it thinking there's some creepy creepy parallels here i haven't seen it what no yet. Wow. i oh need to see goodness. it man. i know i need to see it because i honestly think it will be a bit of a emotional film for you to watch purely because there's probably some little i better go on my own then not with the missus <laughs> yeah, <laughs> start yeah crying. No. right and, and also <laughs> i have to say like i like the film but it, there were some cringy bits in it, some really cringy bits. Yeah, like the first five minutes is basically an advert for Fanatec, which is like, like oh, it was like really? an unboxing video at the beginning of the film, which, <laughs> which was which was fine, right? Because as a as somebody that works in sim racing, the more people who are like, oh, that looks cool, I want one of those, like the better. Um, and there were some little cringy little uh, little phrases in there, but I've loved, I was I, <laughs> I've done I've loved this track a thousand times. Oh yeah, um, oh but yeah, yeah. In terms of the actual journey that obviously Jan goes through it's there's there's so many people that we've had on this podcast now who have basically done the same thing ended up in slightly different places some racing in the real world some racing for a sim racing team full-time some have gone out and created businesses uh that exist in the sim racing world from it but all or the thing that they all have in common is what you just said which is I never thought when I was at school that this is how my life would turn out from a racing game mm. no exactly and I've ha- I mean I've had friends and people that you know I, I know that have gone to the cinema to watch it and they've actually texted me after the film like mate this that film is like what you've done and i was like yeah mad <laughs> like um I, like, it's a good thing that the film is as good as it is it's reaching as many people as it is like when i first saw it got announced i was like is this going to be a bit of a gimmick is it going to make sim racing look mm. a bit rubbish but mm. it's absolutely given it some like credibility to like the masses which i think is really good um but yeah, as you say, like people like Steve and Jimmy, and they've done a very similar story to to Jan. Um, I mean, my story from my year of twenty 2020 twenty and twenty nineteen, it's literally the same journey as Jan in the sense that it was the same people that organised GT Academy that organised World's Fastest Gamer. Mm. I, I had the same mechanics as he had, same engineers, same driver coaches, uh, sort of guiding me through British GT. So every time I did something well or not well, they would be like, right, so. Jan went through the same thing. Jan did this. We spoke to Jan when he was younger. So like I literally lived his journey <laughs> yeah. just seven or eight years later. Um, his journey went on for a bit longer as well. He did a few years, but I only did the one year. But yeah, it was, I, as you say, that film, I'm going to watch it and be like, damn, that is close to home that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it would be really interesting actually to hear your your review of that film uh, when you do manage to go and see it. Mm. So Okay, so something that I noticed was that there seem you seem to uh, have mentioned a couple of times now that the F one game is where a lot of the opportunity was, and you know Veloce was was telling you that perhaps F one is something to consider, and if you're not going to do F one, then it's we need to work out a path. Was it a conscious decision to not race F one as much and move across to things like um, ACC? Was that a preference of the the racing style or the way the game felt? Um, or like, what What was the reason for not, not shunning F1? That sounds very negative, but just deciding not to make that your thing. Well, on my way up, so like when I first started getting paid, like 2018, 2019, like winning F1 esports was like my sole purpose because mm. it was the biggest thing. I was like, right, I need to go and win that. That's going to be the big thing. Until uh, I'd won World's Fastest Gamer at the end of 2019, then my priorities sort of changed. Um, I guess when I started sim racing, I always thought like, I think I had seen people like Jan and stuff go from gaming to real earlier on, a few years earlier. And I was like, if I'd love to do that. I never got, mm. I had a couple of like really club level races before um, getting into gaming, like in 2015. At the end of my karting career, my dad had saved enough to allow me to do two races in Formula Ford. They didn't go that wow. well. And we actually, we spent all the money we basically had and that was it. And it was a few rough years after that. Um, but yeah, so I did have a little glimmer of car experience before I went into gaming. Um, it's worth saying. Um, so yeah, when I won World's Fast Game, my priorities changed because there was an opportunity to race in real life the next year for a whole season, the million dollar drive in GT racing. So mm-hmm. as soon as I got that, I was like, I know F1 Esports is good, but like, that's that's insane. Like, I need to, I need to focus on that as well. So 2020, when I, when I finally got the call up to do F1 Esports as a driver, I was also competing full-time in real life in British GT. So honestly, mm. it was like 
racing F1 esports sometimes on a Wednesday and Thursday, get to the track Friday and then do real racing Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And F1 esports and driving a GT3 in real life, the driving styles you need, <laughs> it's just like polar opposites, man. I mean, it's non-comparable. Um, so I was taking some bad habits. I was I was learning on the F1 game, putting it into the GT car and vice versa. Mm-hmm. And it was all a bit, it wasn't optimal, you know. Um, so my F1 esports season was pretty poor. Uh, my debut season, I, I'd scored a, a few points finishes. It was awful, to be honest. But by the standards, I, I try and set myself. Like I wanted to be at the front and stuff, and it, I was just nowhere. Um, so I got to the end of the season, and I wasn't exactly in demand uh, to, mm. to do another season. Um, I probably could have crafted a way to do the following season, but doing so poorly on such a big stage, I, I was like it's just it's a bit embarrassing and like i, I, I don't know I, I wanted to sort of disconnect myself from f1 esports it was so brutal i was like right let's make next year a bit different i thought i'd be real racing again first of all but i, I saw all these simulators like acc and r factor and ac and i was like let's go let's go over there and try and do some stuff on them you know they look mm. and feel more enjoyable to drive there's competitions on them now let's go and win some stuff on those things um and that's what i did the the next two or three years until today really uh since f1 esports finished in 2020 I, i've just been focusing on every other sim apart from f1 um not to say that you know I, I wouldn't go back i mean the way it is in the minute i probably wouldn't go back but if it changed the physics changed on it completely so it's more like sim like I, I probably would eye up eye it up again you know i mean it's a younger demographic now. I mean, all the kids that are going on there now, like 16, 17, and I'm 25. But I think it, if it went to a full hardcore sim, I definitely fancy my chances to be sort of at the front. So, um, yeah, that's that's the reason I'm not doing it now. It, it's a shame, really, but in it's not all negative because F1 Esports did not go that well, yes, but my real racing season that year went extremely well. And I think mm. it's because I prioritised it over F1. So it's just bad timing, you know. It would have been better to have the real racing one year and F1 the next year, for example, but you can't always have it that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a lot to juggle. Um, And something that I'm really interested in is the differences. uh, So it sounds like the racing itself was, was, as you said, polar opposites. But what was it like in the paddocks? Now, I know to say the paddocks of a a sim racing uh, community, i.e. the F1 esports uh, teams, maybe sounds a little cheesy, but you do all know each other the teams kind of speak to each other there is a sense of it being a bit of a a, a paddock and obviously in the real world paddock it's it's a paddock <laughs> so so what yep. what was it what was it like being in two paddocks in, in one season what were the biggest difference other than the obvious fact that one is real and one is virtual well the, the other thing as well is when i wanted to get into f1 esports it was all lan so like everyone would meet each other and stuff like that where and the year i did it was covid year so it was all done from mm-hmm. home so it's very different. Uh, you know, you don't really speak to many any people apart from your teammates, really. Um, there were the driver's briefings and stuff, but you didn't really speak to anyone. So it's very isolated and, mm. um, yeah, it's a, not, it's a shame, really. I mean, my strength as a driver tends to be at LAN uh, compared to at home. So that's why I fancied my chances quite well. But, yeah, when it's it was done from home, it was a bit more difficult. But not that that's an, an excuse, but, yeah. Um, and then the real paddock, again, it was... I don't think it was the full experience because it was COVID. Everyone was wearing masks. Everyone was like social distancing. And mm. I mean, I mean, we all remember how it was like, no one wanted to talk to anyone. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of people just sat in the trucks the whole time. So I didn't really mingle too much with people, um, but it was still cool. It was still cool. I mean, I do, I do remember the first, um, the first race at Alton park where I qualified fourth and um I, qual- I mean, I qualified on pole, but there was a track limit penalty, so I went back down to fourth. And the day of the race, just before the race, one of the GT4 drivers came up to me, and they were like, um, just uh, just make... I didn't even know them that well. They just came up to me, and they were like, just be careful out there. You know, the race is very different, and it's real, and, you know, just be careful to not hit anything. And I was like, cheers. All right, Please. I will. Thank that, you. Oh, that is a filthy mind game, that, isn't it? Yeah, I don't. I, I genuinely don't think they were trying to get in my head. I think they were trying to. I think they thought, you know, the whole gamer stigma thing. They were like, mm. just you know, I bet you he's a loose cannon. Let's, let's tell him to be careful and whatever. And that's fair enough. Like, you know, I get it. I do get it. But at the <laughs> same time, 
we went and won the race. So, you know. Do you know what? Do you know what? Right. And I, I, I don't want to give you spoilers, but that exact scene happens in the film. Like that, that what you've just described literally yeah. happens <laughs> yeah. in the film, <laughs> in the Gran Turismo film. So stereotypical, that, isn't it? That is, that is absolutely wild. But I mean, that must have felt incredible winning that race from, oh, from man. fourth. I couldn't believe it. I honestly couldn't believe it. And as I wasn't a true pro, I probably uh, sabotaged myself for the next race. So we had two races that day. We had race one and race two later in the afternoon. So when we won race one, we won. We got the champagne and all this stuff. And I was so <laughs> right. elated. I had like half a bottle of champagne, didn't eat. Uh-huh. And then three hours later, we had the next race. And ah. during that race, <laughs> I was like empty stomach, had some champagne. And like I ended up driving around and I was, there was a safety car and um a lot of drivers when they're behind safety car and they're weaving and stuff they get quite queasy um and I got right. queasy and uh, like we were behind the safety car for about half an hour and I was on the brink of being sick and I was like calling in like <laughs> guys I need to I need to box I'm gonna be sick and they were like you have to stay out we're p6 we need these points there's 20 minutes left just get through it and I was like just guys just in your lap yeah yeah <laughs> But I managed to hold it in, and uh, we got sixth. So yeah, but as I say, if I was a true pro, you know, I would have known that race two's coming. I wouldn't have drunk any champagne. I would have <laughs> eaten properly, it, essentially. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but now nah, it's all good. We finished sixth, though, and we actually left that round leading the championship on my debut. Man, I mean, me and Michael O'Brien, my teammate, it's got to be said, he's a great driver, and it was the two of us that season. It was a great year. And I imagine for your uh, your parents, your dad especially, having taking you to karting paid a load for the for the owner kart series and then paid everything that he had for the uh the f4 series and then struggling for a few years i imagine i i don't know but i assume he was there watching that must have been incredible yeah i mean worth saying is formula ford we did not formula four i mean Sorry, formula, formula four is a lot more yeah. money but um yeah. yeah i mean he of course yeah it, i think for him it was sort of validation and my mum as well you know it was validation that it was sort of that the years karting and uh, you know the the wet weekends, uh, you know, sometimes mm. in Scotland where, you know, mm. it's not, it's not nice, but you know, you, you want to take your kid car and stuff. I think it was like validation. It was sort of worth it. All the, the grind and stuff. Cause you know, I, they didn't have that much money, but they still managed to prioritize putting me in a, in a car when sometimes, you know, they didn't have much money for much else. So um, yeah, I think what I'm doing now is definitely a sort of slight reward that all that grind was worth it. So no, nah, it's, it's, it's good. It's really good that it worked out. Yeah, must have been a pretty beautiful moment on the, the podium there. Um, okay, so let's bring it to kind of the present day because you've got quite a lot going on. Um, obviously, you had the uh, ESL R1 tournament earlier in the year. So I think you came fourth as a driver. Your team came sixth, I want to say, and you won round six. Uh, I In season one? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I finished third. Team finished fifth. But yeah, I mean, the main thing was like I was two corners away well, from winning what, the championship. Yeah, the, so. the drama Sim racing of the last wiki one. needs to sort themselves out because they've got you down as uh, as fourth in the driver standings. Just doing me a disservice, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh my goodness, Sim racing wiki has <laughs> let me down <laughs> because the the whole fiasco with the last uh, like the major the summit was that last chicane getting taken out and kind of just losing everything yeah. in the last minute. Like, what was what was the mental state? after that and kind of going into the the next race then after to be fair i was sort of just i was buzzing i was in the mix and at the front and in the you know fight to win um but yeah that particular moment literally driving down the back straight towards the chicane at nurburgring thinking i've got to defend here but i've got the inside i'm gonna i'm gonna win this flipping championship man i was nowhere after round four like i'm gonna win i literally th- i had it in my head like i'm going to win this race and win the thing and then went through the chicane and got taken out and I was facing the wrong way. And I was like, I can't believe it. Mm. Like, it's just gone. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it, it did suck obviously. And I, but you know, as I say, I'm a little bit older now. I'm, I'm not going to lose my head like a lot of say teenagers would. Mm-hmm. Um, so just went and got some food, hydrated and got ready for the next race. And it just, it just didn't work out. I mean, sometimes mm-hmm. it doesn't, it's so close and the margins are so small that sometimes it just doesn't fall your way. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we were watching that in the office when it happened and remember being a bit gutted for you. Um, but, um, <laughs> Thanks. something I'd, I'd noticed, um, 
and again, you, you kind of just said it there. Uh, maybe you've already answered the question, so that you're a bit older, you've got a steady head. But I've always noticed that you don't tend to react to things as much as a lot of other drivers. You seem to be quite cool, calm, collected, and have a sense of kind of perspective uh, when it comes to racing incidents, uh, etc. Um, I'm assuming there's maybe a lot of experience behind that. In that there, you've had incidents in the past and have reacted to them and learned exactly, from, yeah, learned from that exactly learning from mistakes like I've, I've got angry in the past i've you know done some stupid stuff like it's just no point it's just literally no point i mean as you say we, we I, it's probably quite entertaining actually so it's probably why some people get a lot of views um but you know people getting angry and raging and all this stuff like it's just it's just not me like i just don't i don't personally get it you know it doesn't really help the situation it just makes it worse it's probably quite a boring approach but um not saying i won't ever get angry again (laughs) yeah i mean yeah it's not i obviously i do get angry sometimes don't get me wrong but um yeah i don't know why on that situation when it happened uh, there wasn't this internal like i need to shout i need to go and yeah grip him up and like push him around like there was just none of that it was just like that sucks man but i guess there's another race coming up let's get ready for that you know it's just the way i'm wired i guess yeah now um before we start diving into some of the questions that uh, our listeners have sent in um i want to chat about your fundraising uh your crowdfunding um project because i remember watching the video when it came out and you um explained the situation you explained that you'd raced before you wanted to race again but it's uh it, you know it's expensive you're a pay driver um etc um what was the the process leading up to kind of that video and then the, the fundraising afterwards? Well, well, give us a bit of the the, the context behind that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I sort of explained it in the video, but basically, um, it was just a. I kept on having comments and stuff on some of my real racing posts. Um, you know, saying try it, just try crowdfunding. You, you know, allow us to help you, allow us as as followers to help you, and it's quite a controversial thing to do. Obviously, crowdfunding is is typically uh, associated with tragedy and stuff like that um so it's quite a controversial thing to do but i, I just i thought if i do it properly and I, I make sure it's put the right way i'll try it i'll just you know i'll follow my my subscribers sort of recommendation and just see how it goes um and it went it, the first like few weeks were insane like the support mm. was incredible um many or well, a few thousand were raised pretty pretty quickly um, and over the course of the year, it has slowly slowed down, but it's also still built up to a decent figure of around, I think it's like 12,000 now, 12,000 pounds, which I, I I feel very 50-50 about it. I feel guilty in the sense that, you know, part of me feels like did, I wish I didn't do it because I don't like taking money from people. And, from you know, it's not a necessity, me going racing, you know, it's a luxury. I'm very well aware of that. Um, and the other side is like, I listened to my followers who recommended it and it's actually worked somewhat. So mm. in that sense, I'm happy about it. Um, but I guess the the key is now, what do I do with it? Um, and I'm working quite hard in a lot of areas to, you know, I'm working with marketing agencies and, and people like this to, to try and find the bulk of the budget I'd need to go race a full season. And the plan is to make some content that I don't think many drivers have made uh, for that kind of, season um proper behind the scenes proper fly on the wall that's the that's the aim with it and obviously being at the front and winning races and stuff like that um and that twelve thousand that has been raised from the gofundme will be a massive help that you know that can go towards anything in that season that can be your your insurance for the year for the car so if you damage it you don't have to pay too much or it can be an extra test day it could be it can be an extra few sets of tires like it's valuable valuable input um i guess I need to work on getting the bulk of the budget. And when I say the bulk of the budget to go GT3 racing for a season, you're looking between 200 to 300,000 a year pounds, um, which sounds like a lot, but compared to other motorsport categories is actually quite low. I mean, you know, F3 is like a million F2 is like 2 million. So I think it's possible. Uh, I just need to make it work. Yeah. It's, and it feels like, you know, you're, you're definitely kind of in the right place with the right, teams perhaps to get at least to get the exposure to help you get to where you need to to go um is there much of a um a push from 
um, the Mercedes AMG Petronas Esports team to kind of push or, or help you into to real world racing? Is that something that they can or have discussed assisting you with? I, I think it was pretty clear that, that I joined them as an esports driver. Um, mm. And I get that. Uh, they give a lot of advice in terms of, you know, if I have any questions about par- how partnerships should work and what should I do in this situation, they do they do offer some good advice. Um, but yeah, I think it's very clear that I'm a sim racer for them and that's where the line is drawn. Um, but that's just the way it is, you know. Um, that, that's how these esports teams, I think they're quite wary of it, you know, that there's definitely a blurred line between sim racing and real racing. And I think a lot of these esports teams don't want to really get too involved with the real racing bit because it's expensive and... Mm sometimes the viewership's actually lower than esports. So um, yeah. I think they want to keep it very much do esports and that's it. And there's so many, there's so many drivers now doing the sim to real thing. It's, it's insane. I mean, you've got yeah. uh, David Sinitzer who's doing a formula series now, and he's, he's the top sim racer of the past, you know, F1 esports world champion. Um, obviously Steve, obviously Jimmy, uh, Jardy has done a few, a few tests here and there mm. myself a few years ago and last year doing spa 24 hour and, there's actually a few more examples than you'd think, you know? So, um, yeah, it's definitely, I think the unique and cool thing about sim racing is that, is that there's this blurred line. Um, and that's obviously, that's my favorite part about it. It's no secret. So, yeah. Yeah. And and just on that. So if you take Jimmy and Steve and Jardia, you know, they, uh, you can assume are, are using the, the, the money that they're making through their streams, through their, uh, YouTube videos, et cetera um and the exposure that they can kind of leverage <clears throat> against any kind of paid drives to um assist them uh in that so is, is there you know is there a um like a content creating creation strategy that you have in mind to pay for any of this is there anything that you want to do to like ramp up how much you're doing online and how much you're streaming and how many youtube videos you're making etc to be able to support real racing it's yeah it's it's there's so many things going on. Like I try to prioritize it in a certain order and <clears throat> like, I, I think com- competitively competing in esports for me at the minute is number one, um, just because I, I'm at an age where I can, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think I want to make the most of that while I can getting results, getting championships, getting whatever I can. Um, cause I, I know when I get to say 35, I might not be, uh, good enough anymore. Um, the next priority is, as you say, content creation, streaming, making videos, making social media clips. And mm. it, I, it's definitely not my strong suit because I'm just not consistent enough. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's uh, it's not my number one priority, as I've just said. And then after that, you've got trying to do all the businessy stuff to try and find the budget to go racing. You know, that's that's a really important thing as well. So and then there's all, you know, there's general life stuff like keeping fit. You know, if I get fat and overweight and unfit, I'm not going to be able to drive a race car anymore. So if I get the opportunity, I'm not going to be in good shape. There's all these things. That, there's only 24 hours in a day and you got to try and, yeah, uh, do it the best you can. You know, you got to juggle it really well. I mean, competing in ESL R1, for example, is so time consuming and so intense yeah. because you've got some insane drivers on that grid that if you want to win, you, you need to put the effort in. I do want to win. I've not come to a stage yet where I'll, I'll go, I'll just be on that grid to compete and be at the front. You know, I, I do want to, I do want to win. So, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a juggle. Definitely. Do you have anyone helping you? Is there a support network that's kind of helping you with the, with anything from video creation to business to fitness or is it, yeah, or is I've it got... a bit of a one man band? No, I've got some. I've got some good guys helping me. I've got a good editor and uh, Ethan Dean. He's a quality editor. He edits Yano Otmir's videos. Uh, I've got a graphic designer who does my thumbnails and stuff like that. I've got uh, an advisor who helps with like all the real racing stuff, talking to partners and because um, I'm not a businessman, you know. Uh, I, I, he helps me with that. Um, I've got people that help me, you know, an accountant, for example, who helps me with my money. Um, so I've, I've definitely recognized that you need people that are better than mm. you in certain areas to, to do the stuff for you. Cause you know, as you say, I'm not going to do all my accounts and then edit my own videos and then make my own graphics and <laughs> you yeah, never sleep. Uh, mate, <laughs> exactly. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's slowly, but surely getting there and uh, yeah, yeah, it's going well. Well, talking of, um, getting people who are better to do things, um, better to get it, blah, blah, blah. 
this is proving my point, right? <laughs> <laughs> Talking of getting people who are better at doing things than you to help you out. Let's go over to the questions that our listeners have asked. <laughs> oh my goodness, I've butchered that. This Certainly. is why we have questions from the listeners, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Liam, let's have the first one. Sweet. So our first question is actually coming from Ben uh, Alpha Tete from our Discord. And he sent me this question this morning from Australia. So he was barely able to get it in, which is good though. Um, his question is, how do you stay focused in longer races? It's easy to get distracted often in sim racing and like want to look over at your phone. Whereas in real life racing, there's a lot more going on. Does it almost feel easier to stay focused as well? Uh, it's not particularly difficult for like, just, I think for me, the phone thing's never been an issue. Like I don't feel the need <laughs> to go and pick up my phone during a stint. Um, it would be funny though, if on the SLR one stage, just you know, just quickly check on the emails down the street. Hello, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, Mom, I'm, I'm in a race. <laughs> I think I always find that I need to eat well before and and drink quite a lot because I've done stints before where I haven't eaten and I've just woke. Sometimes I woke up late and just jumped on the sim and done a stint, and I feel really like all over the place and you know a bit queasy and so i think it's all in the prep you know just make sure you're like awake and fed and all that stuff and just yeah i don't know what to say really i mean just get into a groove and try and not think too much and just enjoy it just like try and hit you know do lap after lap make every lap better than the last lap and eventually when you get to the end of the stint it should be a decent stint you know mm, kind of hitting that like that flow state trying to yeah you don't always get it but sometimes you do get it and you actually sometimes i i I get it and I'm like, I'm thinking, right, I'm in a groove here. I can literally think about anything and I can still drive perfectly. Mm -hmm. It's very rare you get it, but when you do get it, it's the best feeling. It's like, you just feel like a robot. You're like, oh my God, this is so, this is so good. Um, mm -hmm. Like for example, like last year in Le Mans Virtual Series round four, Sebring, uh, I joined the race for Mercedes in fourth and Max Verstappen for Team Redline was third and he was like 12 seconds up the road and there was like 50 minutes left and that's when I got into like a mad flow state where I was like, right. I think it was a situation as well, like chasing down the F1 world champion, uh, you know, not long to go in the race It's for a podium. And I was like, I was just in this zone where it was just like every lap was just good nailed and so enjoyable. And then I got to him, overtook him. It, that's what it's all about. You know, mm -hmm. that sounds magic. It's cool. Sweet. Uh, so do you want to do uh, the next one, Tom? Yeah, so Mark Raddenbury, who is a great friend of uh, Good Find and a very good graphic designer, does a lot of good liveries, um, Positive Perception. So if you're in need of a livery, check out Positive Perception from Mark. He sent in two questions. One you've actually already answered. Uh, he said, have you ever tried uh, driving anything slower than a GT3 car in, um, in competitions? <laughs> Do you know about Enduro car? We could skip over the Enduro car stuff because I, I, I talk about that far too much. <laughs> That's the 4K thing, isn't it? <laughs> It's the 4KA thing, yeah. So, so we we raced uh, last year. We did a season of six races, endurance races, team racing. So it was uh, the team changed a little bit, but it was uh, myself and Toby from Gridfinder, and then we had Chris Hay joined us uh, for a couple of rounds. We had Jem Hepworth for I think three rounds, and we had uh, Scott Mansell, Driver 61, join us. Oh yeah, yeah, park. yeah. And it was so much fun. The race is like four or five hours each, and you obviously you do the driver swaps and you swap your tires and. You got fifty four KAs on a grid, like it's just the most fun. Mega. Ever. Now it sounds fun. I mean, it's not always the case that the quicker the car, the better the racing. You know, sometimes it's the complete opposite. Um, so yeah, that sounds really. That sounds like a good laugh. Um, it, it was a good laugh, and actually, you could do a whole season for twelve thousand pounds. So you know, just let's do I'll it on that seed. <laughs> so where do I sign? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk afterwards. We'll okay, uh, he also asked his second question, which is okay, more serious. Um, uh, how does he keep that hair so magnificent? Does he have any tips for a going bald livery designer? <laughs> I mean, it's not magnificent. Let's be brutally honest. It's like it's a, it's a liquor gel or li liquor wax, and just put it in there. Maybe get a towel on it, ruffle it up, and away you go. You know. Also, like, can we? To build on that a little bit, what's the, is there like a gym routine? Like I know a lot of like esports professionals have like try to separate their in like on the desk sitting time to like an exercise routine. Like what's, is there a routine there for you? Sort of. So 
up until like the start of this year, um, I never really cared too much about weight or how much I weigh or how fit I, I mean, I always wanted to be sort of in shape. Don't get me wrong. So when I got in a car, I wasn't like blowing out my ass, but at the same time, like this year I weighed myself for the first time in like two or three years. And I used to weigh like 71 kilos. I was a bit of a twig. Um, but then I moved out two years ago with my girlfriend and I subconsciously have been putting on weight so i got to this year and i weighed myself and i was 86 kilos and i was like oh wow. whoa yeah <laughs> i was like where is that I'm like what so i was like that's what that's a bit heavy so when i was um coincidentally speaking to danny john cadella who's a factory amg gt3 driver for um i was sim racing with him earlier in the year he said if you're anything over fully kitted 80 kilos in the gt3 you're losing lap time because they designed the cars and the ballast for 80 kilos so when I was 86 kilos, sort of naked weight, and then you put kit on and stuff, and you're like 89 kilos, I was like nine kilos overweight. So I was like, if I ever got the opportunity to drive a GT3, I'm sort of putting myself at a disadvantage here a bit. Um, and, that, you know, I know it's only nine kilos or 10 kilos, but if you had 10 kilos ballast in ACC, for example, you're going to mm. feel it. Mm. So um, I, I've used this year to sort of cut the weight. So now I'm like 78. I'm, get, I'm trying to aim for like 76. So when I have the kit... I'm like 80 on the dot and um, just like, obviously, you know, I might not drive again, but hopefully I do. But also it's like a bit of a challenge, isn't it? To see how much, how, how well you can cut the weight. And yes, there's a lot of training involved, only eating a certain amount every day. I do a bit of boxing, like once a week, I do a bit of boxing. Um, but yeah, mainly it's like gym work and running and stuff really. So mm -hmm. Sweet. Yes. Yeah. So our next question comes from uh, Strovich, also from our Discord. He says, "When is the first time you? Oh, when was the first time you stepped into a GT car, and how did you prepare mentally prior to the race?" Uh, so it was a test day. Uh, Paul Ricard started twenty twenty. Uh, weirdly, three days before COVID, I, I, I remember that for some reason, um, and. I think until that point, I'd obviously done my karting a few years ago, the two Formula Ford races a few years ago, but I'd won World's Fastest Game at back end of 2019. I did a few club level races in a Citroen C1, uh, nice. which was cool at Brands Hatch, um, just to get my signatures and stuff. And then start of 2020, first real racing experience of the year. Um, it was a GT World Challenge official test, 60 cars, like gt3 there was no gt4 e ease yourself into it it was literally gt3 away you go and um i did some i did loads of prep on the sim before to like get ready for it and uh got there the team was like all pro to uh, jensen team rocket rjn it was called at the time and in the mclaren 720s gt3 and jesus christ it was an absolute whirlwind i was absolutely cacking myself the morning of like <laughs> just i just i'd never driven anything that quick before and i was like if i shunt you know i got a phone call from the guy who organized it um world's fastest gamer and subsequently gt academy and he, he basically alluded to the fact you know good luck and obviously all that stuff but like if you shunt at any point during the season it's a big one there's not really much budget left over to carry on racing so basically if you shunt we're gonna have to stop and I was like, oh, fuck, you're like, this is <laughs> no pressure just, then. Yeah, a bit nerve wracking. Um, so did the, I remember driving down the, uh, getting in the car, getting strapped up, so nervous. Even the mechanic, uh, the chief mechanic was like, chill out, breathe. You're going to be fine. And I was like, <laughs> you're right. I'm going to be fine. So I remember get, driving out the pits, stalling as everyone does, because it's a really stiff clutch, uh, going down the pits and then looking around. It's, this is real. Oh my God, this is mad. And then I pressed the pit speed limiter button and just took off and i was like oh my god this is so powerful oh my god turned into turn one because they have tire warmers and i'd never experienced that before there was so much grip it's, considering you've just come out of the pits the tires mm -hmm. are already up to temp i remember turning in expecting like a bit of sliding to happen it was just direct grip like so much grip into turn one at paul ricard and then it's amazing how the sim racing i guess has trained me to within two or three laps i was on it like from this never driven a gt3 or anything like it to three laps in doing like a respectable middle of the board time to the point where i think the team manager was like just be careful james you know i think he was he saw i was nervous and probably thought mm. you know there's there's a you don't want him to go too quick otherwise he might shunt um but it just it was so natural and i think i, could, I put it all down to the sim i mean i did karting and stuff when i was younger but i think 
that taught me basic things like racecraft and you know having a pair of balls you know don't be don't be scared don't be scared of speed and stuff like that but the sim taught me so much about building up to it technique consistency accuracy pace like all these things and like it just blew my mind at that day just blew my mind at how easy it was it was easier than the sim because you could feel more and like it, it honestly it was insane um so yeah that was a real breakthrough moment and then after that we had the obviously the, the rest of the test and the full season and stuff in bridge gt and i never looked back i felt every time i got in the car i was like i'm not going to shun i'm confident you know i'm quicker than anyone else here you know whether i was or not i don't know but i had the confidence to, to go and think that and we got poles wins and it was insane honestly best year of my life 100 percent. Wow. that is totally mind-blowing wow. yeah I, I can't imagine like the the, the feeling of realizing it's easy because you probably weren't expecting to feel that you probably weren't going into be like i know that this is going to be easy i'm gonna be nervous to, at first but then it's going to be easy you were probably worried that it was going to be quite overwhelming and it's going to take you a long time to catch up with the guys who've been doing it for years and years and years. So but honestly, right. Relief. So like Chris Buncombe, a good friend of mine, he, he helps me, he advises me um, as well through motorsport and just decisions to make and stuff like this. But he's won Le Mans. He used to be a very, very highly regarded driver. Uh, he, because of age, he got downgraded to a bronze and he was the first person. They always put the experienced driver at the start of the day in the car to shake it down and stuff. He went out there, did like five or 10 laps. It was quite a nervous setup, nervous balance because the car wasn't dialed in yet. And I think he did like a, a 156 or something like that, right? Uh, Paul Ricard, just first laps of the day. And lap three of my first experience, which I just talked about, was like a 155. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Like, it's not saying that Chris... You know, Chris probably didn't set a representative lap for him. Don't get me wrong, but to be on the money mm. like straight away was just a shock. I thought I was going to go out there and be doing two minutes five, so you know, something like that. Um, and the same thing as, as Spa last year as well. Spa's a bit more of a cutthroat track, gravel traps everywhere, and um, you know, Eau Rouge. It's real. You know, it's, you're gonna, if you're going to shunt there, it's going to be big. And um, two years out of the car as well. So I was like, have I lost a, a bit here? And I was mm. up against, a f my entire car was full of silver drivers. So up and coming racing drivers who are really competitive. Uh, there was three others and me. They'd been in the car the whole season. I was doing the one race at Spa. Um, and they had the whole morning. And because I'm the, the step-in driver, you basically get the... Um, you get the rough end of the stick. So you get less laps, you get less new tires, you get less priority, which is a double-edged sword really, because I've not had the practice. So you would have thought I'd have more practice to get up to speed, but it, it works the other way around. Mm. That first day, I, I I literally ended the day with the quickest time in that car. That's and like they, they've been in it the whole season. And I'm not saying like I'm a genius where, but what I'm saying <laughs> is, is that any top sim racer that could translate and just have the bollocks to not be afraid of speed, for example, would be smoking a lot of these grids. 100%. That is a hot take. <laughs> that, that it's really a true is. take. It's a true oh take. Oh, my goodness. Uh, but obviously, there are insane talents on in real racing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. Some of the factory drivers and the guys at the top end, insane. Insane. Like, you know, maybe I am dreaming to even be on their level. But majority of the grids in GT racing, for example, are not like that. They're, they're pay drivers and they're people who test every other week and you know mm -hmm. explains why real racers are more and more so using sim racing to gain an advantage right because real racers are super competitive and will do anything they possibly can to gain an advantage over their rivals and um, i think what they're realizing is actually the one of the best ways i can gain an advantage is to spend hours and hours and hours sim racing before every race yeah exactly um yeah, it, I mean, sim racing is is all about practice and muscle memory and stuff. But real, my skill set is uh, is very weird. Like all my teammates say it sometimes, you know, I, I'll go on and I'll practice for like, the, I'm always quickest in my first hour of practice. After two or three hours, I get slower. Um, I end up just driving worse, whereas a lot of drivers get on, take an hour or so to warm up, and then they get quicker as they do more laps. They just get exponentially quicker. Mm -hmm. um, for real motorsport, you need the ability to just jump in and just somehow get on the pace. Um, so I think that particular skill set actually hurts me in sim racing. You know, mm. I, I wish I could sit on there and grind and get quicker and quicker and quicker. 
but in real racing it helps because you don't yeah. have practice you literally you get five or six laps so you got to go out there and do and do it and um it helps me in that sense but yeah i wish i could sometimes grind away and get quicker like some of the other lads in sim racing because it's really helpful for that so we've got loads and loads of questions but i think based on time let i'm going to just pick this last question um which i'm really interested in as well uh we haven't got who sent it in um but thank you you'll know who that you'll know that it's you um what is your favorite non-racing thing to do what gets you away from sim racing slash racing and feeling refreshed great question uh are you just deep in racing all the time no 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 no, no. <laughs> i do i do other stuff but i think honestly just seeing my mates and just doing stuff like mm. going out you know mm-hmm Going, going down the pub just doing normal things you know like it's not obviously I, I could say going to the gym or whatever i don't enjoy the gym that much but i enjoy seeing my mates and going out with them or going places with them and that's that's probably what i do that's the best thing for me to unwind definitely so yeah nothing special really no it makes a lot of sense i don't i don't know if we we're expecting it's uh you know my it, yoga yoga <laughs> is my escape nah, <laughs> yoga me, is my outlet <laughs> without yoga i am nothing <laughs> not quite cool well james thank you so much for your time really appreciate chatting um, you too thank you that thank was for having me yeah it, that, that was that was absolutely great and i think um especially your you know your the stories that you told us about getting in the car and the spa stories that that was i was a little bit mesmerized by that one um so thank you very much really really appreciate it and we'll chat soon yeah cheers guys thank you